My brother wants to put down my dog because he growled at my niece after she taunted him all day. Here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell for notifications. I fostered a multitude of dogs in my life and dealt with a lot of behavioral problems. Dog aggression, cat aggression, food aggression, separation anxiety, super high prey drives. I've seen it all. And I've certainly encountered my fair share of dogs who weren't safe around small children. So I feel extremely confident in saying my current five-year-old lab is safe for kids. He's basically a giant teddy bear and loves everyone. However, it's always been my personal philosophy that dogs and any other animal really should never be left alone with young kids, even if it's the sweetest, most mild-mannered dog in the world. The kids don't understand when they're pushing the dog past its limits, and the dog cannot reasonably be expected to put up with being harassed long after it's signaled that it would like to be left alone. My niece has never been good with my dog. She pulls his tail, climbs on him and lays on him, hits him, pulls his ears, gets in his face and yells at him, and never gives him a second to himself unless she's forced to. Meanwhile, he's basically a saint with her, but every dog has its limits. I stay as on top of this behavior as I can, forcing her to leave him alone when it's starts to seem like too much, and locking him away in the bedroom if she won't. My brother and sister-in-law really just don't get it though. I've tried to talk to them about this behavior a bunch of times, and they know it's wrong, but they think it's wrong in the same way that her refusing to share or not picking up her toys is wrong. They don't understand that it's dangerous, and that if she was left alone long enough, my dog might lose it and attack her. This has been going on for over a year. I've tried to have this conversation with my brother over and over, but he always acts like I'm criticizing his parenting, which is not the case. I don't think my niece is especially bratty or out of control for a kid that age. It's just that this behavior is dangerous to both her and my dog, and it needs constant intervention. The same way that a small kid playing with the stove isn't especially bratty, but it's especially dangerous and needs to be curbed ASAP. I even tried having a dog trainer friend explain this to him, and he still didn't get it. I've tried to come up with excuses for why we can never meet at my house for our family hangouts, but I couldn't think of one the other day, and my brother and niece came over. I was cooking dinner and not paying enough attention to make sure my dog was okay, which was absolutely my fault and I accept responsibility. I asked my brother a few times to keep her away from my dog, but he kept saying she was fine. I did move my niece away away from him a few times, but I wasn't vigilant enough, and my dog ended up getting to the end of his rope and growling at my niece. I immediately grabbed my dog and brought him into my bedroom. I didn't punish him at all. Frankly, I'm glad that he signaled loud and clear that he was uncomfortable. I would never want to discourage him from doing that, because then the next time, he'd skip the growling and go straight to attacking. I came out of the room, ready to talk to my brother about how this is what I've been talking about. But he was furious, yelled that my dog is a menace who should be put down, and left. I completely understood his reaction. That's his daughter, and he was afraid for her, and nothing else mattered to him. But he hasn't calmed down at all since this happened, and won't talk to me except to say my dog needs to be put down and he won't be speaking to me until it's done. He's also tried to involve our parents, who said they'll absolutely not be getting involved. They know my niece's behavior with my dog has been a problem in the past. I haven't heard from my sister-in-law at all, which makes me think she might agree with me. Knowing her personality type, I don't think she'd sit out of a fight like this if she thought my dog was actually dangerous. The way I see it, this is solely my fault and my brother's fault. I shouldn't have allowed my niece to harass my dog. I knew what could happen. And I was more concerned about how upset my brother got when I tried to bring it up than I was about my niece's safety. I should have just said my niece wasn't allowed around my dog until she got a bit older, and dealt with whatever followed there was within my family. Similarly, my brother should have kept a better eye on his kid. 
and not been so defensive when I tried to explain the problem. My dog, on the other hand, put up with being harassed for over a year, and when he finally was pushed to his limits, signaled very loudly and harmlessly that he needed to be removed from the situation. He's not dangerous, and I will not put him down. My brother is now saying that the entire family is sided with a dog over his child, which is not the case. It's just that there are a lot of other solutions to this problem. I'm perfectly happy to crate my dog when they come over, or leave him in another room, or just never have them over again and hang out somewhere else. There's no reason for my niece to ever see my dog again, and I'd be happy to talk over a solution with him. It's just that he won't talk to me at all, and I don't know what to do. Should I give him more time to cool off? Should I go over to his house and try to talk? I don't want to ruin this relationship. We're very close, but I'm just not putting my dog down over this. I gotta say, this might be our most reasonable and mature original poster yet. I don't think there's any point of this story where I disagree with their analysis of the situation. Labs are very gentle, very family-friendly dogs. But yeah, every dog has its limits. This kid sounds like they're just being a kid. But to a dog, they're being an absolute nightmare. It's understandable that the dog would get ticked off and give the kid a warning. The kid's not going to understand that warning, though. And that's where the problem comes in. I think our original poster handled it the best way they could. I agree that you don't want to discourage the dog growling. You need that warning. That's how the poster knew to remove it from the situation before anything really bad happened. I'm sure it still would have taken quite a bit of pushing to really get anywhere. But the dog's trying to let you know. And that's a good thing. The brother really needed to take this more seriously. It was only once there was actually an issue that all of a sudden his papa bear instincts kicked in. And I get that. You're protecting your kid and your emotions are going to go wild in that moment. But I really do agree that there's got to be a better solution here. There's no need for the dog to get put down. He put up with quite a bit before finally just doing the equivalent of speaking up and saying, hey, can you get this kid off me? You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below. And don't forget to subscribe. Karen demands I get fired because I don't know what printer she has at home. So this happened a few years ago when I was 17 and working at my old job. I'm working at a very large electronic and appliance store based in the UK as a sales assistant. I'm positioned in the printer and ink area for the day. In walks Karen. She looks like your typical withered old hag that loves to tick people off for a living. I approach her like we're supposed to do with every customer. Hello, how may I help you today? With my customer service voice and smile. I need ink for my printer. She scoffs while barely looking up at me. That's fine, I just need you to tell me what model printer you have so I can give you your specified type of ink. Every printer along with a couple or more models of each brand use a specific type of ink. So I just need to Google which printer the customer has and it tells me what model of ink they need. She looks up at me looking slightly shocked. Isn't it your job to know this? I explain that I have to know what printer she has and that just the same brand of ink as the printer isn't going to work. So, you're telling me that you don't know what you're doing even though they're paying you to work here? Now, slightly more agitated, I say, There's no way for me to know what model printer you have at home. If you could please go home and take a picture of the model, I can give you the exact ink that will work for you. She snaps and starts walking towards the front desks, saying, You're useless, and I'm gonna get you fired. I first watched her move to the PC repairs guy to bark her carinated version of our encounter, then move on to the cashier girl, and then to my floor manager before walking out. Now, my manager's an understanding guy and knows how crazy some of these people can be. She had told him that I was completely useless at my job and need to be fired right away. Turns out she came in the day after and then the day after that too, just to complain about me and repeat her statement. I didn't get into any sort of trouble for the encounter. Not a crazy story, but a funny one regardless. 
I feel like that's something that a lot of Karens don't realize. Managers are aware of people like you. They know that you come in and have some mild issue with an employee and blow things up out of proportion. That half the crap that comes out of your mouth isn't true and that they're probably going to be backing their employee. Employees that have to deal with this on a daily basis like to know that their manager has their back. You're most likely not going to get the result you want. French students harass and bully me for asking them to speak English in an English taught class, so I get them expelled. This happened a few years back in China at one of the universities there. Here, I was studying Chinese language, and I shared my language class with some people from France and Belgium. Our Chinese teacher was a really nice little lady that also happened to speak French. So often, when the French speakers had a question, they would ask it in French. Now, I didn't really mind it all that much, but at some point, it got to the point where about half the questions in the class were asked in a language I didn't understand. Obviously, that's detrimental to my own learning experience, since understanding the questions is important for me to learn the language. So I politely asked them if we could just do the class in English, because about half of us didn't understand what was being asked. The teacher was very nice about it, and afterwards asked the students if they could rephrase their question in English when they asked it in French. But apparently the French and Belgian students didn't take it so well. They were constantly glaring at me, and whispering among themselves in French. Well, I just shrugged and moved on. However, outside of class, they were always sticking together in their own little group, doing things together. At first, they would just walk past me when I was sitting down having a beer with my friends, and they would just glare. But at some point, it came down to them cursing, talking crap about me to other students, and spitting on my lap when I was sitting in the park. Obviously, I was seething, so I might have called them a few words which were a bit too unsavory. Anyhow, they didn't take it well. So the next day, I found out that they had scribbled all sorts of horrible things on my dorm room. Obviously, I was ticked, but I didn't really know what to do. So I reported it to the international student office. ISO was really nice and understanding, but told me they can't actually do much unless I provide proof that something's happening. Thus, I went online and bought a little recording camera, kinda like a dash cam. It had the time and date and everything. After the university had painted my room door over, they couldn't get the markers off apparently, I hung the camera up in a corner of our dorm corridor and pointed it at my door. Then I left and made sure to loop around to walk past the group of French slash Belgians so that they knew I was leaving campus towards the metro station. I had some nice dumpling soup and a beer and when I came back, lo and behold, they were hardly creative with their insults, just more of the same. But this time I had proof. I checked the video and I was very pleased. Five out of the seven of the group were actually there and all wrote down something on the door with permanent marker. One of the guys even kicked the door, which caused a crack at the bottom. These doors weren't very sturdy. They seemed to have a lot of fun doing it. Now, of course, the school was properly ticked off when I showed them the video. Normally, the students would just get a stern warning. But because ISO was aware that they were doing it before, and also about the fact that they were harassing me the whole time, they were less understanding and suggested that the board had to decide on this to expel the students. And so they were. All of this took place over the course of a couple of months. So we were nearing the end of the semester. The five students who scribbled on my door got expelled just before their exams, which meant that all the time they spent at the university was effectively worthless, since they didn't receive any credits for it. But it gets even better. After this whole ordeal, I had sent a neat anonymous letter in Chinese. One of my Chinese friends helped me write it. I sent it to the Public Security Bureau, letting them know that these students had engaged in vandalism at our university. A few weeks later, after I had already returned home, I was told by a friend of mine who was on good terms with their group that some of them had booked tickets and hostels to travel in China at the end of the semester. However, their visa extension was denied by the Public Security Bureau on the basis of their misdemeanor at the university. I'm not sure if the second part was caused because of my letter or simply because the university informed the police, but I like to pretend that it was the former. So I was just laughing my butt off as they slaved away half a year in courses for which they'd receive no credit and had to cancel thousands of dollars worth of travel plans. That was a truly sweet, sweet feeling.
I feel like it's a bit of a difficult situation to be in. Asking people not to speak their native language is typically not going to go over well. Even with the best intentions, people tend to be sensitive about that. It's a very difficult topic to broach. In this instance, I feel everything checked out. The teacher agreed that stuff was being missed by the English speaking students. Sure, it would be great to be able to speak to your teacher in your native language, but not at the cost of the other students in the class. If you guys are having one one-on-one -on -one time, then that's totally fine. But when you're in a class and everyone speaks one language and half of you speak a second language, you should be speaking the language that everyone speaks. Especially considering that this is a university where people are essentially paying for knowledge. While you might not think that your question or the answer is overly important to their education, you don't know in the long run. All of it is knowledge that is being exchanged, and they have a right to know what's being said. While I understand that it can be something sensitive to have to bring up, I feel it needs to be understood in cases like this. Entitled driver wrecks his brand new car, then injures and blames me, a pedestrian, for his wreck. So, backstory. I work for a subcontracting company that does really niche IT work for various municipal governments, and my truck is loaded with equipment for computer repair and road work. Like I said, it's niche, but this becomes important later. As such, I currently have a two-hour commute, and while I do use the interstate during the day, I usually head home closer to midnight, and prefer to take state highways and back roads due to the lower speed limits. So, for our cast, we have me, Brad, the entitled driver, Renee, my fiancé and co-worker, nice girlfriend, Brad's female companion, and Chad, Brad's absolutely chill father. Now for the story. So as Renee and I were driving home tonight, we had noticed that a large rotted poplar tree had become uprooted and fallen into the road, covering both lanes. Normally I would have called local officials and then either waited for the tree to be removed or simply wait for them to arrive and then take a different route. Unfortunately, I had no cell reception in this area and rerouting would have added an extra hour to my already long commute. As such, I figured I'd try to use my demolition hammer, which was the best thing available to me at the time, to try and at least weaken it until someone came by with cell reception. Then we could flag them down and get a call to local authorities. So I turned on our hazards, turned on our beacon, and Renee and I both put on our reflective vests and hard hats with built-in lamps. While Renee brought the tools over to the tree, I began grabbing the traffic cones to block the road. Enter Brad. As I finished setting up the cones behind the truck, Renee began handing me the cones to put up in front of the fallen tree. No sooner had I begun reaching for them when we heard the roar of a brand new Sunrise Orange Dodge Charger RT flying up the back road with a 30 mile per hour speed limit at highway speeds. I ran in front of the fallen tree, shining my flashlight on the already well illuminated tree, and tried to flank down the charger. It was no use. He never even hit his brakes. I dove out of the way at the last second as the charger charger plowed into the tree, turning it into a horizontal fulcrum, and me into a baseball, as the tree struck my shoulder and launched me about 10 feet. I got up, extreme pain throughout my left side, and unable to raise my arm. Adrenaline coursing through me, I ran, or hobbled quickly, to the remains of the poor obliterated charger, now smoking and leaking fluids all over the road. Miraculously, Brad and nice girlfriend, both about my age in their early 20s, got out and were completely unharmed, though understandably shaken. Renee, who miraculously found the one spot with coverage, called emergency emergency services, and nice girlfriend called Chad. That's when I heard it. Oh my god, my car! How could this happen? Why does this always happen to me? What would- And that was when he looked at me, looked at the clearly uprooted tree, and decided to have a unique reaction. One that I never thought ever really happened. One that sounded like- <laughs> At this point, I think maybe he's injured too. Dude, are you okay? No, idiot! Because of you, my car's completely totaled! What kind of moron cuts down a tree in the middle of the road? 
Actually, the tree was already here. We only got here maybe two or three. BS, you blinded me with that flashing strobe light. Pointing at the yellow hazard beacon on my truck, which I've used for years. This is when his nice girlfriend chimes in. Actually, I think that- Shut up, all of you. I'm gonna sue you for failing to illuminate the tree properly. This is irrelevant. At this point, I'm trying to be nice. Well, actually that's- If you open your mouth one more time, I'm gonna- This is when Renee steps in in all her four and a half foot glory. Enough! It's not his fault that you clearly acquired your driver's license at a Happy Meal. That tree's very well illuminated. You clearly weren't paying any attention and you heard him. Look at him. He's limping. Jerk, you're the one who ought to be apologizing for that stunt you pulled and the mess you made. Silence. Deathly unnerving silence. As Brad stood slack jawed and making a strange choral noise. Suddenly, Brad's on an absolute rampage, kicking and throwing my cones, tools, and other various items from and around my truck into the forest and off the road's 15-foot embankment. I wish I could tell you more, but it was about that time that Chad arrived along with first responders. We gave our statements, and I spent the rest of the time being checked out by EMS. The only thing that jerk really seemed to be worried about, though, was his car. Alright, so for this one, he's a young guy who just crashed his really nice new car. He's gonna be upset. The reaction he had, though, was more comical than anything. It sounds like he was having a complete meltdown, and just kind of pointing that anger in the wrong direction. Yelling at his girlfriend who was just in the car accident with him, though, is what really leads me to believe he's a jerk. If it weren't for that, I could have accepted that maybe he was just having a bad day and letting it all out. But when you're more worried about the car than your girlfriend, that's where I draw the line. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Or if you want some vibey music to put on in the background, check out Easy Mode. If you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot. Everything's linked in the description.